As we look around us in this complex world, we see information everywhere. From the cars we drive, to the mobile phones we use, to the image you're watching right now. Information is everywhere and is an essential part of our lives. We're drowning in information and yet starving for knowledge. With so much information all around us, have you ever stopped to ponder the information of life? The code that's in every cell, every piece of DNA, and all living things. Hi, my name's Chris, and we're going to dive deep into the world of cellular biology and information science to see if we might get a little closer to the big question, where did we come from? You know, even though we've made many breakthrough discoveries in science, there's still so much more to be discovered. It will be through these discoveries that we'll be able to cure disease, improve our well-being, and possibly discover the origin of life. And with the most common worldview of life's origin being chemical evolution, how does this scenario align itself with our knowledge of information science? Information science is changing the way that we think about all living systems. So what is information? Is order and organization information? When we look at nature, we see a lot of organization. Salt crystals, stalactites, even a sand dune could be considered organized. However, these would be considered examples of self-order. What about a simple snowflake? Is there order to its structure? Look under a microscope and see in amazing detail these exquisite patterns. Water, cold air, gravity, and time gives you snowflakes. In a cavern, water, minerals, gravity, and time equals stalactites and stalagmites. How about a tornado or a hurricane? These are powerful self-ordered forces, but do they contain meaningful information? The answer is no. They do contain data, which is determined by physical constraints, but not information. The behavior of these things are governed by what we now know as the chaos theory, which simply stated, is the study of how order forms naturally without design. How about a penny? It would seem strange to say that this object has order and organization, but no information. After all, a piece of metal could never become this perfectly round on its own. The letters and imagery clearly show information and organization as well. Could Mount Rushmore in South Dakota have occurred from years of exposure to the elements where the soft rock has eroded away while the hard rock remained, giving us the impression of past presidents? Not likely. So the real question is, can information form by chance? It seems that things containing information are highly organized, but there's more than just order. Much more. Information is intangible because there's always a sender of the information and there's always a receiver of the information that has some ability to decipher the information, decipher the, the meaning behind the information that's being sent and then changing into some meaningful, useful purpose. Information must have a sender and receiver in order to communicate. For instance, these flashing lights have no meaning to us. But what happens when we place them in a straight line and add color? Now we recognize the code that's being transmitted directing us to stop at red and go on green. This preconceived knowledge is important and it makes a big difference in our everyday lives. In fact, without this knowledge, our travels would become quite chaotic and dangerous. So you see that even a simple code like these traffic signals can be considered information if knowledge is sent and received. In a moment, we'll discuss the information in living systems, but first, let's discuss three main categories of information that scientists use. 
The first is called Shannon information. Shannon information provides only a mathematical measure of probability. Like if we rolled a die 100 times and recorded the results. This would give us data, but it would be random data, not useful information. The second category is called functional information. This is information that's useful and practical, like our traffic lights. Information is sent by the source and understood by the receiver in order to ensure safe travel. The last category is called prescriptive information. Prescriptive information is what we're going to be primarily focusing on. It's instructional information used to determine what choices to make and could even be based on a record of choices already made. In order for something to be considered prescription, the receiver of the message must have the knowledge of the source's alphabet, rules, and encryption in order to decipher the message and act on it. For instance, have you ever seen what software code looks like? At first glance, it just looks like a bunch of random characters. However, if you know what those characters represent and you have a system to decipher the code, you can understand and create extremely powerful prescriptive programs. Think about it. What at first appears to be just meaningless ones and zeros is actually information, knowledge, just waiting to be interpreted and executed. It's incredible to think about how much information exists all around us. New York City is a pretty busy place. The traffic, the people, the messaging, the systems of transportation. But when comparing a living cell to this great city, New York pales in comparison. A cell is so complex that scientists have only scratched the surface of what really goes on in there. However, even with our limited understanding, what we do know is that the inner workings of a simple cell are simply extraordinary. It's almost like there's a miniature city and every cell and everybody has their own little job. If uh, the, all the traffic lights decided to all just go crazy, you have issues that not only are do we fix the light, but also we have traffic issues, we have crime issues, we have problems that snowball from one part breaking down. Amino acids are the most basic building blocks of life. Each amino acid is an organic molecule that has a carboxylic acid and amine group attached to the same carbon atom. Here are two organic molecules that have the same composition but are mirror images of each other. These are known as right-handed and left-handed amino acids. Amazingly, living organisms only use and produce left-handed amino acids. Scientists have no explanations for this. When amino acids are created in a laboratory, an equal number of left-handed and right-handed amino acids are produced. It's a fascinating mystery that living systems only produce and use left-handed amino acids. Equally fascinating, these amino acids have many different functions. One particularly important function is its role as the building blocks of proteins. Proteins are linear chains of amino acids. Every protein is chemically defined by its unique sequence of amino acid residues. Just as the letters of the alphabet can be combined to form a variety of words, amino acids can be linked together in varying sequences to form a vast variety of proteins. Even the simplest life generally has thousands of proteins. These proteins are essential to organisms and are involved in virtually every process within a living cell. Proteins have structural and mechanical functions. For instance, in muscles and the cytoskeleton, they help to maintain cell shape, while other proteins are important in cell signaling, immune responses, cell adhesion, and the cellular life cycle. One particular protein called a motor protein transports various cellular cargo, like energy-producing mitochondria to cellular neighborhoods in need of fuel. They can also provide the pulling power needed to separate chromosomes during cell division. Amino acids carry information from one part of a cell to another, as well as to other cells within the organism. So as you can see, without amino acids and proteins, 
basic cell structure as we know it could not exist. Other important types of proteins are enzymes. Enzymes are catalytic proteins that have special slots which hold other molecules to make chemical reactions possible. There are over 2,000 enzymes and each one is used to enable a chemical reaction without ultimately being altered itself. It's been observed that the slowest biological reaction would take a trillion years without an enzyme, but the same reaction takes only a hundredth of a second when the enzyme is present. Pretty impressive. Adenosine triphosphate, otherwise referred to as ATP, is the energy source the enzyme uses to enable the reaction. Living organisms require and manufacture these enzymes along with all the other proteins. Let's briefly examine how proteins are created. This animation demonstrates how the digital information encoded within DNA is used to direct protein synthesis. This is a DNA double helix containing the digital code which directs the cell in all aspects of operation. And here we see a protein complex called an RNA polymerase traveling down the DNA strand. As it moves down the strand, it carefully unwinds the DNA, preparing it for transcription. Inside the polymerase, we see a single-stranded copy of the original instructions being assembled as individual bases are positioned and added to the growing strand. A stop code marks the end of the protein specification, at which point this copy, known as a messenger RNA transcript, exits the polymerase and heads towards a two-part chemical manufacturing machine called the ribosome. While the messenger RNA moves towards the ribosome, transfer RNA molecules attach to specific amino acids in preparation for assembly. As the messenger RNA transcript passes through the ribosome, the process of translation begins. Using the instructions encoded on the messenger RNA as a template, the transfer RNA molecules align specific sequences of bases to corresponding amino acids, creating a protein chain. As this chain exits the ribosome, it is met by chaperones which prevent premature folding, while escorting the protein to a barrel-shaped machine called a chaperonin. This machine helps fold the protein into the precise shape required to perform its function. Although it is unclear how the chaperonin achieves this, we do know that accurate folding is essential in order for the protein to accomplish its intended function. Once the protein is complete, it is released into the cytoplasm to do its job. As you can see, Protein synthesis is an amazing process which occurs constantly in our bodies. Now, get this, ribosomes are made from RNA and proteins, so the ribosomes are made of the very proteins they manufacture. In fact, it takes over 150 existing proteins to manufacture just one protein. So in essence, it takes a protein to make a protein. It's this chicken and egg scenario that continues to baffle scientists. There are thousands or millions of interacting computers in every cell that uh, communicate with one another. They read the information, they transfer information from one component to another component. There are many different uh, operating systems involved. There are different programming languages involved with the various components that are within the cell. And all of them have the same components that any other computer would have. 